All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network. Um, on behalf of OpenChannels.org and the APM Tools Network, I'd like to welcome you here today. Um, today's webinar is Discovering Data and Informing Regional Ocean Health Priorities with the West Coast Ocean Data Portal by Todd Hellenbeck uh, with the West Coast Ocean Data Portal. And we're very glad Todd could be here today. Um, We'll get started in just a minute, but before we get started, I wanted to let everyone know how you can ask questions. So there's two ways. You can raise your virtual hand. You have a little hand icon in your user interface. You can raise that, and you can ask, I'll unmute you, and you can ask the question directly to Todd. Or you can type the question into the question panel of your user interface, and then I'll relay the question. Um, the first option of raising your virtual hand and being unmuted only works if you've entered the PIN number, if you're using the phone, or if you have a working mic, if you're using um, your computer audio. Um, and we'll hold most questions till after the main presentation. We, we uh, always reserve time for question and answer. Um, so we'll hold most of the questions till the end unless it's a quick clarifying question, in which case um, I may uh, stop Todd just to, to get the clarification. Uh, okay, well thank you Todd, we very much appreciate you being here today. Thanks Sarah, I appreciate, I appreciate being here as well. Um, excited to present some information about a project that we've been working on for the last couple of years, uh, published Associate Data Portal, and really hope to um, impress upon folks both the opportunity to use this uh, tool as a resource, but also as something that users and individuals and organizations can also contribute to so that we can increase our uh, body of knowledge around West Coast Ocean um, issues and, and data. So for my talk today, I'm going to provide a little bit of background on our uh, sort of context for the Ocean Data Portal what it is, um, some of our recent work to inform um, one of the priority regional ocean health issues around marine debris, and uh, run through some demonstrations of the tool itself, which is always scary, but I hope will work today. <clears throat> In terms of where we got started, I <clears throat> And I should say, I'm the coordinator for the Ocean Data Portal. Um, I'm based in Alameda, um, the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, I got involved with the West Coast Governors Alliance uh, two years ago as a fellow uh, after finishing graduate school. And it's an organization that is geared at sort of mirroring the, uh, or matching the scale of government to the scale of the ecosystem that we're trying to manage. And in this case, the California current large marine ecosystem stretches along our coast. And in comparison to some of the other sort of regions of the United States, uh, we have a large area covering a lot of uh, geographic uh, territory. And the recognition that we're on, all on the West Coast connected through this large marine ecosystem. And so the West Coast Governors Alliance got started in about 2006 as an effort to sort of match that government uh, and management ability to that scale of the ecosystem. And it's made up uh, at the leadership level of uh, governor's office representatives from the three states of California, Oregon, and Washington, as well as uh, supported and co-led by um, leadership from NOAA, EPA, and the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. And there, primarily focused on identifying regional ocean health issues that it makes sense to collaborate on, um, identifying these issues and helping to support uh, teams of experts to uh, identify work and actions to help address these issues. And uh, recently, in 2010, the WCGA identified and narrowed down their, their sort of priorities to um, climate change and adaptation to sea level rise, marine debris prevention and monitoring, uh, ocean acidification science, and most recently the concept of data sharing 
as a priority for the West Coast. Um, this was a recognition that in each of these other sort of more traditional uh, ocean health issues, there's a strong component and need to both uh, bring best available science into this regional discussion as well as be able to share and um, illustrate these issues through a platform and a common set of data that uh, stakeholders and decision makers could use on the West Coast. And so that's really where the West Coast Ocean Data Portal was born from, um, largely with this goal to both increase the discovery of uh, ocean and coastal data, um, better connect the data managers and users to ultimately inform resource management, policy development, and planning on the West Coast. And so these three goals are sort of been our kind of marching orders, so to speak, over the last few years. And we've, under the umbrella of the Ocean Data Portal, we implement these goals through a series of a set of kind of projects that we work on. And in terms of the discovery component, we've developed and launched a data catalog that um, increases access to geospatial data from around the West Coast. Um, related to our goal of connecting users and data managers, uh, we have a human network of uh, these individuals from different sectors and organizations, state, federal, tribal, um, NGO, et cetera, that uh, work to, to link and help guide the progress of the portal. This was really a very central component of this effort, um, recognizing that a lot of the technology issues are ones that can be relatively easy, easily solved, but that the um, sometimes the bigger hurdles are actually getting people together and connecting them. And so, so we focused a lot of attention on that. And then most recently, uh, with the launch of our data viewer, we began to actually do the cool work of you know, taking the foundation of the data discovery and the human network and beginning to inform ocean health issues. And I'm going to take a little bit of time to, to talk about each of these um, in a little bit more detail just to give you a sense of what, we're, what we've been working on. And so the, the ocean um, data catalog is really a um, catalog of geospatial data from around the West Coast. And it uh, is based on Esri GeoPortal platform, and it harvests metadata from a variety of portals, catalogs, and systems from around the West Coast and the nation. And this is where I'll spend just, you know, one minute talking about metadata. I know this can be a bit of a um, bad word to some people, but it's really important in this project. And um, a lot of times, the, I think we're all fairly well uh, versed on the importance of metadata being a sort of documentation of the science behind a particular data set, you know, the methods that it's used to collect that data, et cetera. Um, what we've been realizing and um, experiencing over the last sort of 10 years or so is a bit of a transformation of metadata from not only that documentation of the science, but also the primary means by which um, folks can actually discover the data and access it. And in some cases, um, from state, regional, and national systems, the metadata is actually sort of the front face of the data set, even before people will, you know, look at a shape file or some, you know, the underlying data. And, and so it's really, really important, um, both in our project as well as these burgeoning um, state, regional, and national portals. And so we put a lot of effort into um, simplifying how we consume metadata, really strengthening the way that we can reach out and connect to various systems around the country, and also providing technical support to in individuals who want to connect stuff to the portal but maybe um, need some help with getting the metadata into the right format. And we support and endorse and, and um, can harvest from a variety of um, metadata standards, whether it's FGDC or ISO. Um, 
and have spent a lot of time thinking about how we can be very open to bringing data in from a variety of different partners. And so we take this information that we harvest from around the, the country and around the West Coast and curate it around the issues that are sort of relevant to the ocean uh, community here on the West Coast, in particular around those priority health issues of sea level rise, climate, uh, climate change, ocean acidification, and marine debris that the WCGA uh, has identified. And in terms of that support network for the um, contribution and uh, uh, metadata into the Ocean Data Portal, our network of data managers and users has been really instrumental in um, identifying and articulating sort of best practices, providing trainings, um, and essentially building capacity on the West Coast for individuals to share and publish data in ways that can be accessible to the greatest number of people. And this, we've really started to see some extremely uh, valuable data sets become liberated because of the um, work that this network has been able to, to put together. Um, additionally, this community is a really important part of this project in that by identifying individuals with various levels of technical capacity and or resources, we can sort of provide a, a bit of a matchmaking role for folks that have data sets they want to publish but maybe don't have that technical capacity to do so. Um, and be, by matching them with other partners within the network can still work towards that end goal of making sure that that data is available and discoverable. And then like I mentioned, um, one of the last pieces of the portal that we launched was the Ocean Data Viewer. And this is where we really allow for the exploration and the understanding of some of these ocean um, health issues. It utilizes web services from a variety of partners. Um, essentially everything about this system is distributed and um, pulling from around the country. And again, provides both those informative pieces related to ocean health issues as well as a, a lot of the contextual data that will help users understand those issues. Um, and while we were in the process of sort of developing that last, uh, the Ocean Data Viewer, we went through a use case approach to, um, to this technological development to help ensure that we would ultimately have users at the end of the process that were excited and interested in using the tool. And this use case approach is uh, really valuable because it, it engages users at the very beginning of the technology development cycle and really gets at, you know, what are the policy management questions that individuals are interested in asking and, and addressing. From that starting point, we can then, you know, find the data and build the tools to help um, uh, allow for those questions to be explored and addressed and to provide some understanding of what the issues are to, to our, our users and stakeholders. Um, the, the sort of connecting piece to, to that is being able to use those tools to engage um, users and provide a call to action or a way to help feedback into the policy um, context. And so this has been sort of a approach that we've taken with a number of the different components of our portal and um, I think it worked really well here in the context of the marine debris issue that we sort of tackled first or at least have tried to uh, provide data and tools around. And so as we were getting started on the use case project, we pulled together a lot of marine debris experts um, both from the research community, cleanup volunteers, policy advocates, state and federal managers who are all dealing with this issue and who, you know, had articulated needs around data and tools. And when we got them, um, when we started asking them about, you know, what are the policy questions that you'd like to address, we got a very, very um, long list of things that would be uh, great to have data and tools for, you know, uh, how everything from how can I just get at a marine debris data set um, more quickly to if I, you know, put a piece of 
trash into a coastal waterway, where will it end up in six months? Um, these were, you know, the full spectrum, and you know, we had to sort of both look at our own abilities, our the data that was available to us, and the um, resources that we had to narrow in on a sort of core set of questions that were really pertinent to the West Coast and that we could do within their time and resources. And so a lot of these were really focused on planning of cleanups, um, especially given limited resources and wanting to understand both from the beach cleanup side of point as uh, point of view as well as the derelict gear um, out in our oceans. You know, where should these cleanups take it place in order to prioritize those? Um, because the West Coast had also uh, recently, both in California and Oregon, gone through a process to plan and implement uh, marine reserves and marine protected areas, providing tools to give users a better understanding of how debris was entering those spatial areas and potentially affecting conservation goals was a really important um, task. And then also, we're really fortunate um, on the West Coast to have some great policies that are you know, at the city, county, and even state level that are taking a proactive stance against debris prevention. And, and so one of the sort of more interesting questions that we wanted to address was since these policies have been implemented over the last 10 years, are we starting to see effects in terms of the composition and amount of debris on our coast? And so these uh, set of questions really got us started and gave us the impetus to start looking for data that could help address them. And one of the primary sources that we um, investigated was another West Coast Governors Alliance asset that had been developed by the Marine Debris team, um, which is this marine debris database um, where cleanup organizations that are doing cleanups or derelict gear removals um, on the coast can essentially submit their data cards either individually or in, in these sort of bulk uploads to the database so that we can start to see across the whole West Coast and across all these organizations, you know, what are some of the baselines of debris that we're seeing, where is it located, and you know what's the composition. And so this was a really great resource. Um, there are limitations to it that I'll discuss later, but uh, provided us a wonderful opportunity to tap into the sort of the stakeholder collected data and be able to use that in combination with, with some other data sets that were relevant. And so from those policy questions, um, we determined that you know visualization of this data was going to be very important. Um, so developing this map interface with tools that allowed users to both filter by time and the debris types were going to be really relevant. And, and so we went ahead and did that. And then the kind of part that is that connection to, you know, how, how do we engage the users to action um, was uh, developing a few uh, opportunities within the viewer to share maps, you know, print maps, and sort of link back to the marine debris database so that folks could uh, be empowered to contribute data to that um, database as well. And so um, that was a really fruitful process and led to what I think has been a, a great tool in the Ocean Data Portal and that's seen quite a bit of use so far. And I want to Go now to portal.westcoastoceans.org to, um, to essentially provide a bit of a short demo of sort of some of the common ways that folks are now using the portal to, to address those questions and others. Um, and so when you go to our homepage, you see um, a variety, uh, something that is basically geared at helping users drill down to the data that they are interested in, including some curated and filtered lists of um, the catalog, um, as well as you know, open text search and, and some of the data related to our um, different priority issues. And so 
um, like I said, this is built on Ezra GeoPortal, but you would not necessarily know that this was GeoPortal based on this interface. Um, we've tried to simplify it, clean it up, and make it really user-friendly, um, which had been all, um, I guess, limitations of the sort of out-of-the-box GeoPortal. So as I click through here, you'll see that um, we pull up sort of a list of biological biological tagged data sets. And that can be a little bit hard to sort through, and so um, we provide a number of filters to allow folks to sort of drill down into a more specific subset of the data set. So I'm clicking a location off of Oregon, since I'm interested in that. I'm also really interested in sort of plant and um, algae data sets. Uh, so I'm using our sort of curated list of categories to, to filter the subset. We have two results, um, and I'm really only interested in sort of federal data sets. So from the marine cadaster pulling uh, the seagrasses data set, which I can now explore in a little bit more detail to see, you know, both, um, you know, attributes of the date that's published, the abstract, um, who it was created by, and importantly, you know, relevant contacts should I ask questions. Um, also incredibly important are the actual formats that the data set, that the data is available in. As we're pulling this from a variety of different partners, um, state, federal, local, NGO, you know, each has different constraints about how they can share and publish data. And so in some cases, all we have is a point of contact and a name that folks can, can con connect with. In other cases, um, we have a full suite of, you know, downloadable um, data that can be brought into a desktop GIS, uh, as well as um, web services from a variety of different flavors. And so for all those layers that do have uh, web services associated with them, you can jump directly to our um, map viewer to sort of start exploring that data set and beginning to see what it looks like and if it's going to meet your needs. Um, and so, you know, this is sort of how we envision, uh, envision folks coming through and exploring the portal uh, to find the data that they're looking for. Um, you can see a variety of just the, the breadth of um, catalogs that we're pulling from, uh, both from university labs, state, federal, um, to get a sense of, of where the sources of data are coming from. And we're always looking to expand that. Um, uh, additionally, I mentioned some of the aspects of our um, blog and our data network. And so one of the kind of important things that we've listed here is a the community page that essentially uh, provides profiles and information about individuals that are partic participating in the network um, so you can understand who has the expertise that you're interested in um, connecting with and um, making those connections that way, um, as well as sort of a, a blog to introduce events, funding opportunities, um, sort of our current activities, um, and then really exciting to provide some of the um, training resources that we're hoping will, again, help build the capacity on the West Coast for greater and more powerful data sharing. Um, the um, Inform tab um, gets folks to our set of uh, sort of priority issues. Right now we have focused on the marine debris issue and by clicking through there you get to, you know, get a short snippet of, you know, what the what the issue is, what people are dealing with on the West Coast, some infographic about the sort of metrics and numbers of the associated with the problem. And importantly, sort of some bookmarked uh, map views that allow users to explore some of these debris stories that we've developed in partnership with uh, the green debris community. And so when you click on these, these will actually get you into the, uh, the map viewer with a 
sub subset of uh, data layers turned on to really as related to that three story. And in this case, we're really interested in um, where new cleanups should be planned. And so one of the, as I, if I move through here, I'll try to describe some of the different tools and functions, but um, I think for the most part, folks are fairly well versed in, in how these types of web mapping applications work. Um, so I'll, I'll mainly focus on the data and the debris stories that we're talking about here. And we know that one of the primary sort of land-based sources of debris are, are where there are urban and urban centers. And so right now we're pulling up a U.S. population density service, and I'm drilling down into the sort of San Francisco Bay Area, which is where I live. And in addition to the, um, and so as, as cleanup organizers are interested in um, planning new cleanups, they may be taking into account this type of information to understand, you know, where are going to be the greatest sources of debris um, and trash entering our waterways. But this may not be enough necessarily to allow for a high uh, prioritization of those resources. And so another um, component that users had asked for was understanding, you know, where debris is going to be sort of concentrated given things like uh, ocean surface currents. And so pulling in a surface currents, uh, monthly average surface currents from June uh, from the West Coast Regional um, Integrated Ocean Observing Systems Network, um, we see that you know there's a sort of circular pattern of uh, flow in the San Francisco Bay and uh, concentrating on the east side of the bay. Um, furthermore, users were interested to know, you know, where are critical habitats that may be uh, especially sensitive to debris entering their environment. And so, um, you know, using the search bar to sort of explore the data set, I see that there's a California snowy plover data set that indicates, you know, where this critical habitat is and for these shorebirds that are particularly sensitive to these types of um, inputs to the beach and waterway. And so you see that this kind of faint um, red boxes popped up um, on the east side of the bay. And so this information can then be used by cleanup organiz uh, organizations or organizers to sort of really drill down into what, what are some of the priority areas that may be um, important to target for cleanup activities. And this is, you know, can be verified by ground truthing this, you know, in terms of actually having people go down to this area and see if there are um, debris on the in the waterways here and on the beach and in the marsh, um, as well as it can be an opportunity to reach out to uh, groups that may be currently working on this uh, in this area and basically connect with them and you know, bridge this marine debris community. Um, one of the other, and this can be done along the coast, one of the other um, important activities that individuals were interested in um, understanding were things around um, not just beach cleanup planning, but also the uh, prioritization of derelict fishing gear um, that makes its way into our waterways. Um, I'm turning on a derelict gear layer right now, um, and the gray uh, circles essentially relate to the counts of uh, items found in a particular area. And so here um, is where you can use some of the filter tools to see exactly, you know, kind of what you're looking at. And in this case, we're looking at um, derelict gear cleanups that have taken place from 2012 to 2015. And, you know, in terms of the last bits of data um, that come in, you know, things things can take time to make their way into the system. But um, you can see where some of the cleanups have taken place during that time period. Um, much more would show up if we went back to 
the 2000s. Um, but in terms of planning for future cleanups, um, you know, understanding where fixed gear fishing is occurring, uh, a, a layer here we're pulling from NOAA, um, can really help organizations, you know, target specific areas that are heavily fished um, as likely spots where uh, derelict gear may accumulate and should be targeted for cleanup actions. <clears throat> as um, I highlighted before, some of the important um, uh, priorities that the West Coast had were related to the um, understanding of marine protected areas, where they are, and where um, beach cleanups are affecting uh, those those conservation areas. And so um, here I'm going to pull on another layer from NOAA related to the MPA inventory and um, drill down to a marine reserve in Oregon. Um, this is the Otter Rocks Marine Reserve, uh, here highlighted in blue. And this was um, this was a, a no-take you know, marine reserve um, I set up to protect the coastal ecosystems and um, biological communities here. Um, it was passed in 2010 and then implemented in June of 2011. So I'm interested in seeing, you know, what since it's been implemented, which what have been some of the debris impacts in this area. I just turned on our beach cleanup data layer, and here the green bubbles, similar to the derelict fishing gear, represent the number of items um, found in a particular location. As you zoom in or out, um, these bubbles aggregate and disaggregate based on the level of view. But we can can zoom into the Otter Rock Marine Reserve here and um, basically set our time filter to the time period we're interested in here. In this case, since the Otter Rock Marine Reserve had been implemented in June of 2011, that's where I'm going to start. I'm going to update the filter. And this is pulling from the Marine Debris Database. So things. The beauty of distributed systems as well as the you know detriment is that things can go down sometimes, things can take longer, but for the most part, that's another place where the network comes in where we can easily communicate with folks if things um, aren't working. But um, in this case, you can see that um, since 2011, there's been you know over 1,500 pieces of debris found from this location. If we click on the bubble itself, we can see sort of more detail about what has been found there. In particular, you can see things um, like cigarette butts, um, metal, and a big majority of the um, uh, debris that has been found in that location had been plastics, over 1,600 pieces. And so this gives you a sense of you know, the composition of that debris, as well as you know, specifically where those um, activities took place, and also here providing one opportunity for users to sort of find their way back to the marine debris database so that they can understand how they might be able to contribute data um, to this effort. Um, so, and that's uh, a marine reserve in Oregon. The same um, work can be done in California and or in Washington um, for their set of marine protected areas. Um, and so one of the um, sort of more, I guess, interesting and potentially complicated um, debris stories that we developed was around the understanding of how effective different debris policies have been um, in terms of sort of helping change the composition, limit the amount of debris that's coming into our beaches. Here, as you, you kind of see the overall picture of the West Coast, you can definitely see where some of the sort of hot spots of debris are. Again, these are aggregated from a variety of cleanups um, since 2011. Um, but I want to travel now to 
the southern part of our coast to Los Angeles uh, County. And Los Angeles uh, County bent foam containers from public facilities in 2011. So I'm turning on some layers that we developed related to the the jurisdictions that have implemented, um, city and county jurisdictions that have implemented and and or passed um, bank bans, or sorry, foam container bans here on uh, the West Coast here in Los Angeles. And um, this is an opportunity for individuals and users to basically do sort of a comparison in terms of before and after these um, policies have been implemented to ascertain their effectiveness. And so uh, the policy went into effect in January, or basically in the beginning of 2011. And so I'm going to be using the um, our time filters to, to basically show the time period before and the time period after the bank ban went into effect. So I'm going to start January 2007 to January 1st, 2011. And so these time sliders are great for you know being able to specify that. Furthermore, I, I'm, we're really only interested in the you know styrofoam containers that um, this ban pertains to, and so one of the uh, there's a yeah. question: is there, is there a published list of foam and bag bans that this is pulling from? Yeah, um, there are a number of nonprofits that have kind of compiled um, bans from both plastic bag bans, foam polystyrene, and I believe it's a cigarette band. Um, I'm struggling to think of the name. It's not a dynamic polling from. We update this with our marine debris partners on a fairly regular basis, but basically they'll, they'll, they'll say in like alphabetical list what the jurisdictions are, when those bans were put into place, and you know, what they pertain to. Um, and I can definitely include those links after this. But that's where we're getting the information. We're developing the data layer from that and then updating it as new bands come into place. OK, great. Thank you. Um, so here I'm, I'm going to filter this list uh, just to be the styrofoam uh, food containers. And we, sit, we see sort of a much you know, a dramatic reduce, reduction in the, the numbers here, um, but you can sort of confirm that these are just related to the sort of styrofoam food, uh, food containers. Um, so, you know, take a look, try to see what that number is. And, and one of the things that we provided is um, ways for users to both share this map, um, you know, both embedding and sharing with links, as well as, you know, being able to print the maps so that, you know, you can actually do this sort of comparison um, or create materials to um, share with colleagues. And so now um, we want to, this is the before, the ban, you know, the four years before the ban was enacted. And so I'm going to do the same sort of analysis, but uh, for the four years after. Um, so from January 1st, 2011 to January 1st, 2015, and update the filter here. And you can start to see, it's quick, so <laughs> hopefully you, you, you memorize those numbers already, but you can start to see um, both the overall reduction as well as some specific um, sort of patterns that emerged in terms of where other food containers have popped up, such as down here in the uh, Long Beach area, and where the most dramatic reductions have taken place. And it's in overall, this has sort of represented about a 60% reduction in those uh, items being collected on the beach. However, this is also where um, it's important to sort of be mindful about the data that we are showing. In this case, these are 
um, volunteer uh, collected information that are then uploaded to the marine debris database. So, you know, there's a lot of caveats with regard to that type of data in that it's um, across organizations, not collected in the same ways. Um, terms for different debris types can be very different. Um, food containers versus styrofoam um, are all different ways that we've tried to, uh, on the back end, make these things as comparable as possible, but there still are a lot of caveats about that. And um, importantly, you know, again, debris that's collected that isn't uploaded doesn't make its way in here. Um, also, areas that are monitored that don't have debris on them um, aren't, you know, reflected here. So it's not necessarily a comprehensive view, but it's some of the best available data we have um, for this issue. And, and so it begins to give that sort of high-level assessment of what the trends are, what the, um, what's happening along the coast, to then give users a bit of an opportunity to, you know, again, share those maps, um, investigate and download this data so that they can do further, more sophisticated analysis on their desktop, um, and as well as provide sort of a call to action for individuals who are interested in this to upload the data that they do collect um, so that we do get a better and more complete picture of, of what we're finding on our beaches, where that is, and um, how it changes over time. And so um, that's also where we've been reaching out and working closely with the sort of NOAA Marine Debris Program to figure out ways to incorporate um, some of the different ways that they uh, monitor in a more robust fashion um, different sites along the coast, as well as reaching out to other cleanup groups. Um, I think this represents about 12 to 15 cleanup groups here. We know there are many more that are doing work on the coast. And so trying to um, enable this to create awareness of this issue, but also better connect that community of debris uh, cleanup organizations to uh, collaborate and uh, contribute data to this uh, tool so that we can ask more and more robust and more complex questions. Of that information. So that's the sort of um, high level sort of uh, understanding of some of the debris stories that we're, we've been working on. Um, there's a great number of data sets to explore within this uh, catalog, both from the biological, human, physical side, as well as related to some of the sea level rise issues on the West Coast. We're going to be expanding those components um, in similar ways to what we've done with marine debris over the next couple months. And so we do anticipate to be sort of targeting some of these other um, priority ocean, West Coast Ocean Health issues uh, in a similar way. But this is where our pilot, this is sort of our pilot. And we're excited to be able to do outreach and, and share this with uh, the community now. Um, as I come back to this, um, there were definitely a lot of lessons learned about this process. Um, the use case approach was very beneficial in, again, understanding what those policy questions were that we wanted to, to address. The you know tool that does everything has sort of gone um, out of out of fashion, and so really narrowing in on what those uh, questions and how the data, information, and tools can address that is really important. Um, as I mentioned, limitations of the data are, are very real and should not be overlooked. Um, that being said, where things are the best available, they should be used and pointed to. Um, trying to create those opportunities for users to then both contribute data themselves, to do their own sort of analysis, to be able to um, feedback into the policy realm by connecting with some of the other marine debris organizations and of the WCBA um, has been a really fantastic aspect of this project that um, I think we're starting to uh, do good things in, but there's always room for improvement. And then just broadly in terms of the overall um, work of the Ocean Data Portal, 
clearly the long-term sustainable funding is critical for um, continued development and um, ability to provide provide these resources to um, the community. So with that, um, I will wrap this up and um, encourage everyone to definitely explore the West Coast Ocean Data Portal, um, to contact me if there's questions uh, about the tool or interest in a more targeted demos or interest in contributing data, and also to thank um, some of our primary funders, uh, both NOAA and the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, for their contributions. And um, yeah, Sarah, I think that's, that's about it. Okay, great. Thank you, Todd. Uh, that was a great overview of the portal and all its capacities. Um, okay, so we did have one question, and if anybody else has additional questions, please go ahead and send them in now. We, um, you can type. You can send them in by typing them into the question panel of the user interface or raising your virtual hand and then I'll unmute you. So the question we have right now, um, so someone asked, I'm interested in the underlying mechanics of, for example, what software, APIs, et cetera, are used to construct the portal. Is there any documentation that explains how the platform is constructed? Yes, absolutely. Um, both from the sort of catalog side, um, you know, largely being Azure GeoPortal to the data viewer side, mainly built on open layers and with like a Django backend and some JavaScript and stuff in the, in the middle. There are, um, we definitely rely on the APIs between our marine debris database as well. And so I do have um, some documentation on that sort of architecture as well as the software stack and I'm happy to share that. Most of our um, code is also on GitHub at the, uh, in a variety of places, um, so I would be able to point you to that as well. And we have worked with a number of organizations already to kind of adapt um, essentially our GeoPortal and uh, custom UI so that they can use it for their own uh, organization or community of practice and are happy to do so with anyone else that's interested. It, it helps us um, to have a community of folks interested in, in this kind of particular piece of software that's contributing to it. So, yeah, very happy to provide that. Um, if, okay. Uh, okay, great. Or I'll, I'll let Robert contact you directly. Yeah, Todd's email is up there uh, uh, right now. Uh, and there's a question, is data stored on site or linked from other portals, uh, for example, marinecadaster.org? For the data sets and web services themselves, our uh, utmost goal and sort of our original, we, well, We've been really blessed on the West Coast to have a really strong um, sort of state infrastructure of um, portals and catalogs, as well as folks that are publishing data, as well as resources from the cadaster and national systems that are also. And so our goal um, across all of those is to really enable the data providers, um, the authoritative managers of that data, to publish in a way that we can consume, but that really any other sort of third party or, you know, state application um, can make use of in, you know, whatever needs they have. So whether it's web services or, or um, downloadable shapefiles. And so I would say 100% of the um, data that you see within the portal is being served and managed by the hosts themselves. Um, the only thing that we um, sort of, I guess, store within our sort of database is the metadata records and, you know, those are XML files that are, are, are fairly um, light. So it's really the power of providing those, those download or web service linkages within the metadata records that enable this sort of thing to um, sort of flourish. And so, yeah, everything's provided by the, uh, the hosts and the authoritative managers themselves. Okay, great. Um, let's see, we have a bunch more questions. Uh, okay, is there still effort underway to integrate standardized marine debris monitoring data? As you mentioned, counts from cleanups come with many caveats, namely effort is really variable. So a, a perceived reduction in styrofoam could just be due to less people out collecting debris. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's 
one of the biggest limitations of the, of the current data set that we're relying on here. Um, we are still extremely interested in trying to sort of provide that more, I, I would I continue to say, sort of robust monitoring data um, through this portal. Um, they would, I think, likely be you know, separate data sets because they're really reflecting different um, methodologies of collecting that information. Um, we're, you know, in the midst of sort of sorting through some of the technical details that would be needed to connect to something like the NOAA uh, monitoring database and, and things like that. Um, but it's absolutely one of our primary goals and um, I think will really help to elucidate some of those differences like you, you mentioned that the marine debris database is got limitations based on how that data is collected um, and so yeah we, we really want to link with those more robust methodologies. Okay. Um, let's see, is there any expectation that a similar system will be created for the East Coast as well and if so when? Specifically for marine debris? Um, well. In terms of the sort of overall umbrella, you know, related to portals, is clearly um, other regional uh, efforts that we've learned from in our development, both from the Northeast, Mid Atlantic, South Atlantic, Gulf of Mexico, et cetera. And so, um, I think the, the the reason that we have sort of taken marine debris on specifically um, as a prior issue was because that was a priority of our, you know, state and federal governments here on the West Coast. Um, other regions are dealing with a different set of, you know, priorities, whether it's, you know, renewable energy planning or habitat protection. And so it may be that their um, priority to incorporate that stuff in their regional portal has, you know, not been their, their first um, move. Um, however, we do know that a number of other sort of NGOs um, are have created data visualization tools that sort of reflect their cleanup information, and so they're they're not necessarily aggregating across organizations um, at that scale, but um, providing again sort of best available information. Um, some really great work out of the University of Georgia. Um, as well as five gyres and things like that. So, not at this scale um, or you know in this approach, but there are uh, some other similar type resources uh, for, for other parts of the country. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Todd. Um, let's see. Will you be including analytical capabilities in the future, tailored to the consumers of your data? Yes. Well, I, I think that really depends, again, on the sort of future use cases that we um, take on and the you know ability to, to incorporate those needs within the portal. Um, in particular, there are some emerging needs uh, around regional um, ocean planning. These may or may not be best suited to be dealt with within the um, context of the Ocean Data Portal, um, in which case there are sort of state, sub-regional sort of systems that may be well suited, whether it's sort of state, existing state portals or other applications like things like C-Sketch um, that do a really wonderful job of providing some of those analytics as well as some of the, um, you know, more uh, stakeholder-based input. Um, so depending on the scale of of that effort, um, if it's truly West Coast or if it's more at those um, smaller subregions, that will help determine, you know, what sort of analytical functions we have here. In, the, in supporting those efforts, you know, discovery and technical capacity to publish data is still going to be really important to, to fuel those, um, but our sort of analytical capacity may not be as needed. For some of the other uh, ocean data, sorry, the ocean health issues, where they're not being met by some other um, tools, there there probably is likelihood that additional analytical capacity would be brought in, um, whether that's for some of the sea level rise or ocean acidification work or some of the emerging ocean health priorities that are coming um, 
to fruition as a result of the West Coast Government Alliance sort of merging and sort of in the transition period where they're um, essentially engaging and bringing tribal leadership and uh, tribal governments into the sort of decision-making realm of the, the regional ocean partnership. And so that may um, articulate new ocean health priorities that, again, we'd be well suited to provide some analytical capability for. I do see, though, that um, the sort of function of some of the web applications is probably, it will, will never, well, in the way that we're building it, won't replace sort of the desktop GIS that will provide this sort of much more robust suite of analytical capabilities. But where there's some value that we can add, um, we will definitely be pursuing this. Okay, great. Thank you, Todd. Um, let's see. Where on the website do you provide a standard template for tracking debris collected during a beach cleanup? Well, that's a great question. There is right now no standard. Um, that was a huge hurdle in both the development of the marine debris database as well as how we were able to consume data in the portal. Um, we went through a very um, long process of developing a semantic ontology to link the ways that different debris groups um, sort of classify the debris types that they're collecting, again, whether it's plastics, plastic bags, grocery bags, um, trash bags. You know, we've developed a sort of on the back end ontology that uh, links all these terms together that are related, and that was a really important place where the marine debris experts were able to um, contribute their knowledge. Um, the what this did sort of I think highlight was the need for a more standardized way for groups to um, record their information. And so part of what the Marine Debris sort of action team or sort of the Marine Debris Alliance that has formed on the West Coast that is linking these groups is doing is having those discussions within the Marine Debris community about, you know, what makes sense if we were to go to a common base card or sorry, data card and, you know, what would be the benefits. Clearly one of them would be the quicker and more easy integration of um, this information from a variety of cleanup groups. So, um, that work is ongoing, but right now we don't we don't have a common base card. We're sort of relying on the marine debris experts to sort that out um, with, within the cleanup communities. Okay, thank you, John. Um, let's see, one last question: the marine protected areas layer that you demoed can be visualized, but data and metadata cannot be downloaded. Is this a temporary issue with the system being down, or are there or are some GIS information not available for download? That's a great question. Um, the services and data that we provide both in the catalog and the viewer are, um, again, uh, being provided by the authoritative providers. And in some cases, that means that they have are only providing a web service. Um, in some cases, they have provided the web service, the download, the metadata, et cetera. And so, some of these are uh, administrative issues on, uh, that you know I can that I should be able to resolve. In some cases, there are real um, limitations of how that data is published, and so kind of a case by case basis, um, we can't enforce that everything is available as a download, uh, but we really can encourage that and provide the resources to help those organizations make that stuff available. In that specific case, um, I believe those data sets should be available for downloads, so it might be a, um, like a QAQC issue on, on say, my end or the portal administration. So thank you for pointing that out, and I'm very, very happy to hear those um, uh, questions or uh, note observations so that I can you know, improve the performance on my end. Okay. Well, Todd, this was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, we had, there's, there's a really uh, good overview and of the portal and uh, cap debris capabilities and good Q&A. So thank you everyone who attended. Um, Todd is about to travel to China, so have a great trip, Todd. And uh, thank you everyone for attending. We hope to see you at future webinars. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks everyone for participating today. Okay. Bye, everyone.